Hey everyone, welcome back to this six part lecture series on the ethical implications of emerging virtual and augmented reality technologies. I'm Marcus Carter, I'm a lecturer at the University of Sydney and in this video I'm going to be discussing the issues of accessibility, inclusivity and exclusion that are prevalent with VR and AR technologies today. So although um, VR is often positioned as an accessible medium in large part due to its natural or intuitive user interface, they're actually less accessible than they may initially seem. The main issues that we identified in our research were to do with disability and access accessible design, something to do with and to do with the macula masculinized and toxic cultures that surround VR gaming. So despite being often framed as having a more natural user interface in the sense that VR relies on movements and gestures of the body rather than understanding how a, a video game controller works, for instance, this isn't necessarily something that's intuitive or natural to all bodies. Specifically, the bodily interface for most virtual reality devices presents accessibility issues for people with disabilities. For example, unlike Steam's VR devices, the Oculus Quest doesn't allow the user to manually change the height of their avatar. The result is that games expecting an able-bodied standing user will cause perspective problems, making characters talking over users' heads, having everybody at sitting while, while viewing the world from sitting height, and creating difficulties with doing things like aiming weapons or picking up objects. Much of the literature here makes claims about accessibility that are very common to critical disability perspectives on technology, which focus on how ableist and exclusionary values get encoded into the design of technology, which limit the capacities of people with disabilities to use them. Now, exclusion happens when we solve problems using our own biases. Microsoft's inclusive design principles are pretty good. They encourage us to seek out these exclusions and use them as opportunities to create new ideas and inclusive designs. Recognizing exclusion not only includes more people, but it reflects how people actually are. Everybody has abilities and limits to these abilities. Designing for people with permanent disabilities actually results in things that can benefit people universally. Now, Mott suggests five key forms of accessibility that are needed in the current generation of virtual reality technologies. We need more content accessibility, like introducing baseline features, like just the ability to change text size. We need interaction accessibility, accounting for different bodies and allowing different forms of gestural input for those with a limited mobility, and not punishing people who can't move their bodies in the same, uh, in, in normative ways. We also need device accessibility, developing hardware that's accessible to a wider range of bodies, or at least offering the option to reconfigure it so it's appropriate for people with disabilities. We need, also need more inclusive representations in games, diversity in avatar creation, to include those with disabilities. And we need application diversity, offering a range of different applications in VR. VR currently places a really heavy emphasis on very active gaming. Able Gamers, a disability advocacy group for video games, suggests that more, we need more VR experiences. Right? Uh, rather than mechanically and gesturally demanding games, we need um, via th things that we can consume passively to address some of these accessibility issues. And they note that VR often privileges the visual and, and uh, the, the gestural aspects, but audio receives much less focus. But audio can really be made up, be used to make up for some users' inability to respond with their body in particular ways. So the other dimension of issues with accessibility and inclusivity with virtual and augmented reality are around gender. This is both at the level of experiencing gameplay, but also more broadly in terms of the gendered biases that surround it, the production and the designed into virtual reality technologies. So Jordan Bellamy wrote in 2016 about her experiences of a virtual groping in the social archery game Quiver. She writes that between a wave of zombies and demons uh, to shoot down, Jordan was hanging out next to a user called Big Bro 442, waiting for their next attack. Suddenly, Big Bro's disembodied helmet faced me head on. Her floating, his floating hand approached my body and he started to virtually rub my chest. She goes on to detail her response. Stop, I cried. 
I must have laughed from the embarrassment and the ridiculousness of the situation. This goaded the user on, and even when Jordan turned away from him, he chased her around, making grabbing and pinching motions near her chest. Emboldened, he even shoved his hand towards her virtual crotch and began rubbing. There she was, she writes, being virtually groped in a snowy fortress with my brother-in-law and husband watching on. Outside of the total immersion of the quiver world, Jordan writes, it must have looked pretty funny and definitely not real. But as she says, the virtual groping feels just as real. And of course, you're not physically being touched, but it's still scary as hell. So this account that Jordan provides is really reminiscent of earlier observations about virtual harassment, specifically Julian Dibble's well-known article, A Rape in Cyberspace, from 1993, in which a user, expert in the affordances of the text-based virtual environment that Julian was studying, non-consensually mediated sexual encounters between other players and themselves, something no less harmful despite there being no bodies touched. If we want to argue that VR feels real and it can make us we can use it for simulations and training because it feels so real, so close to the real environment. We have to acknowledge that virtual assault also feels real. VR-based sexual harassment is real sexual harassment. And it's particularly problematic due to how VR affords the user this immersive and auditorially and visually rich experience. What can we do to address these forms of mediated harassment? And this is a serious issue. Research by Jessica Outlaw found that 49% of women and 36% of men, male respondents reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment while in multi-user virtual reality. And there are design solutions. Quiver, um, after Jordan's article, um, introduced a new feature which gave people a, a bubble around them that other users couldn't intrude on to give you that kind of sense of personal space that was protected. So writing in the conversation, Catherine Costa suggested that we really need to take seriously VR-based sexual harassment as a form of sexual harassment, arguing that, quote, the media interface of a game does not make abusive behavior between two or more real people any less abusive. Slurs are still slurs. Unwanted sexual advances are still unwanted and asexual. Despite this, Catherine notes responses to Jordan's VR harassment tended to downplay its severity due to its digital setting, placing the onus on the victim who could have just taken off her headset. Sounds like a pretty classic example of exclusion to me. Now beyond these issues with harassment, there are other issues to do with gender and the design of accessible VR experience. Dana Boyd provocatively asks in 2014, is the Oculus Rift sexist? In reference to the physical side effects of nausea, herself and other female colleagues have felt using Oculus VR. Dana suggests that the cause is humans using depth cues to determine how far away objects are. This is what's causing motion sickness. But Boyd elaborates, noting that there are actually two types of clue, cues. There's, there's motion parallax, which tells the brain of an object is getting, getting larger, it's getting closer, and shape form shading, which gives the brain a sense of an object's distance due to the way that the light is cast on the object. Crucially, Boyd argues, as motion parallax is easier to uh, replicate in VR, VR systems primarily rely on it. But the problem with this is that men tend to prioritize motion parallax cues, while women rely more on shape, form, shading. These key physiological differences in gender haven't been taken into account in the design process, resulting in issues of accessibility, a case highlighting the importance of incorporating a more diverse range of perspectives into the design of VR and technology more broadly. More recent empirical work has found that women are at a greater risk of motion sickness from VR, which has had significant consequences in terms of access and inclusion as VR becomes more widely and available and used in contexts like education. And research has also found that women are underrepresented in, as participants in VR user studies and also as authors of VR research. So these issues of accessibility, inclusivity, and exclusion need to remain at the forefront of discussions around the growth and proliferation of virtual reality and augmented reality. Acknowledging these issues and placing them at the forefront of an inclusive approach to design 
will ensure that everybody can enjoy the benefits of virtual reality. Thanks for checking out this video in the series. Don't forget to look at the full ethical implications of emerging mixed reality technologies report, link in the video description below, which has further details on all of these aspects and references to many additional resources on this topic. Thanks for watching this video. I'm Marcus Carter and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks very much.